Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CJCA Positive Youth Development Committee's Education Webinar Series. This is our fifth in a series of webinars this year focused on education in the juvenile justice system. Today's webinar focuses on obstacles and remedies to the re-enrollment re and engagement of adjudicated youth. I want to first thank all of you for taking the time to participate in the webinar series, and a special thanks to Peter Forbes, Commissioner in Massachusetts DYS, Phil Harris from Temple University, and Simone Gonsolin from the American Institute of Research, who, uh, who have all put a great deal of work into preparation of these webinars, as well as our presenters for today, who Peter will introduce shortly. For those of you who might be new to CJCA, we were a national nonprofit organization formed in 1994 to improve juvenile justice systems, local secure correctional and residential facilities, services, programs, and most importantly, the long-term outcomes for youth and their families. CJCA represents the youth and juvenile justice systems CEOs in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and various other major metropolitan counties across the country. So thank you again for everyone for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Jonah, who's in our CJCA office in Braintree, Massachusetts, for a few housekeeping. For a few housekeeping. Thank you, Mike. Just a few quick housekeeping guidelines before we get started here. All attendees will be muted for this webinar. However, you can ask questions at any time by typing them into your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, questions will be answered uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. The webinar is also being recorded, and the link to the audio recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent out following the close of the webinar. And now I'll turn it over to Peter Forbes for some introductions, who we're happy to have with us here in the CJCA office. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Peter. Uh, Mike, thank you for the introduction. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Mike Dempsey and the team at CJCA for sponsoring the series. Mike recognized Phil and Simone. Uh, Michelle Phillips on my team at DYS has also been part of a, an ad hoc group. We've been recruiting people um, at different points of interest nationally on the education piece for juvenile justice. And today we're really fortunate to have Heather Griller Clark and Peter Leone. So I'm going to do a, a, an abbreviated bio intro, and then we're going to turn it right over to Peter and Heather. Heather is a principal research specialist with the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. She's been working with and on behalf of youth with disabilities in the juvenile justice since 1993. She's currently principal investigator with Saroop Mather on Project RISE reentry, intervention, and support for engagement, an OSEP-funded model, demonstration grant with the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections, and RISE IT. She's a trainer and evaluator for, merging, for the Merging Two Worlds Transition Curriculum. Peter is a professor in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Ed at the University of Maryland. He received his BA and MA in History and Special Ed, respectively, at the University of Iowa and his PhD in SPED at the University of Washington. During his professional career, he has taught adolescents with behavioral disorders in the public schools, trained teachers, and studied education programs and practices in institutional settings, provided technical assistance in jails, detention centers, training schools, and prisons in a number of states. He's the former director of the National Center on Education, Disability, and Juvenile Justice at the I hope that's the University of Maryland, UM. And I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited, and I want to thank Peter and Heather for taking the time to share with us some perspective on uh, educational strategies, basically. So I'm, I'm going to go to, I'm not sure if it's Peter or Heather first. Um, it's, uh, it's Peter. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Peter. Um, can you all hear me? OK. So. Um, what Heather and I are going to do in the next um, half an hour or 40 minutes or so is, is uh, attempt to talk about uh, a number of very specific issues related to transition of youth uh, from correctional facilities back to the community with a, with a particular focus on education. Um, so in, this, in our session, um, we're going to emphasize the importance of planning the transition process uh, the, the critical uh, role that collaboration uh, plays in the process, 
the importance of engaging not just youth, but partners in the community, as well as uh, various providers um, and agencies who work sometimes in the fence and sometimes in the community. We'll talk about the importance of uh, monitoring and evaluating um, the process and supporting uh, youth and partner agencies as they um, support transition for youth. And then finally, um, a, an area that's often an, an afterthought, and that is, is evaluation, the importance of um, gathering good data on the process. Um, um, I think an overriding um, issue uh, that I think Heather and I both share is, is the importance of understanding what works so that we avoid um, uh, deciding or, or making statements about the failure of kids to successfully transition when in fact we don't have good data about why or when or under what circumstances things worked and what circumstances they didn't work. So um, that's, that's a basic, I think a basic um, underlying assumption that both Heather and I make. Heather? Heather? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna start us off with talking about um, outcomes related to transition. And I think it's important for us to remember to think broadly about transition. Um, transition doesn't just happen at one time. We're not just speaking about reentry or release from a correctional facility back to the community. The youth that are in our care have multiple transitions. They transition from their home or placement or foster care settings into a short term, perhaps, detention facility. And then they transition again from a detention facility to a long-term correctional facility if they're adjudicated. And they may, within those facilities, transition multiple times to different housing units. And then they transition out of those facilities back to their communities. And, and that transition, again, can be followed by multiple placements, residential care, uh, foster care. Um, so it's important for us to remember that when we talk about outcomes, we're thinking multiple transitions, not just a one time only transition. So we want to improve these outcomes for obviously for the individuals that we're working with, the youth. Um, and we know that it's not a, not a one size only fits model. We know that um, some youth will transition to school. Some youth will transition to work. Uh, we know that we need to individualize these transitions for kids with disabilities or kids that are involved uh, with multiple agencies, those crossover youth. Um, and what we really are trying to, to foster in, in our kids is productive engagement. Um, we want them to be engaged productively in whatever type of environment they're transitioning to, whether that be school or work or a placement. Um, so we really need to consider individualized outcomes. What is successful for one student may not be the same thing as what is considered successful for another student. We also need to think about our community-based outcomes. Um, how do we engage the community in these multiple transitions? Um, for transitions to school, that can be enrollments, that can be um, fostering uh, fewer public school suspensions and expulsions. Um, outcomes can include smoother transitions to community-based facilities that are, and those transitions are focused on what the, the individual needs, not necessarily on who has an open bed. Um, we know that uh, in our outcomes, we need to be linked to resources. Uh, and the resources are gonna be localized for each community. Um, but when you think about what you want out in terms of outcomes related to transition, uh, you can define those um, according to your resources. So if you're hired a new transition specialist 
and you want to measure the effectiveness of that transition specialist, you're looking for outcomes related to that individual's uh, job performance, connectedness with the community, how many interactions with youth they have, uh, things of that nature. If your outcomes are related to school-based resources, you can measure things like graduations and transition plans and, and how frequently students meet goals and objectives in those transition plans. Um, which brings us to the, to the fourth item in terms of outcomes. We want to make sure that they're measurable. Um, whatever your jurisdiction prioritizes as important in regards to transition, you want to know and be able to articulate how you will measure that. Um, are, is it things like number of enrollments in school, number of graduations, number of career and technical education courses enrolled in, or number of uh, apprenticeships, job apprenticeships youth acquire and maintain, or number of, of employ, youth that are employed post-release? Um, whatever is prioritized as for transition is what should be measured. And, and um, if I can just we, jump in, Heather, Heather I, I think the, a main issue is that we, we have to get beyond thinking of recidivism or rearrest or return to the detention center is the only metric for looking at success. We want to be able to measure, as, as Heather suggests, engagement. engagement. Absolutely. So we know that uh, achieving those outcomes are not always easy. There are numerous obstacles that both our systems face and the youth within our systems face um, in ensuring successful transitions. Uh, one of those uh, is inadequate information that can take many forms. We know that we frequently hear and talk about uh, the inability of records to follow youth in a timely fashion. Um, I think we're making small progress in that area, um, but that's something that we continue to, to battle. Uh, adequate information can also take the form of um, how accurate or, or reliable are those assessments that youth have been given over the course of their a school or, or correctional stays. Um, sometimes the, the test results that are included in a transition plan or an, or an individual education plan for kids with disabilities are three and four and five years old. So that information may not be 100% relevant uh, anymore. So we need to ensure that the information we obtain and create for youth um, is, is adequate. Uh, we know that one of the other challenges um, to providing successful transition is um, defining who we're working with and um, what the needs are of that population. Providing transition is, is very different for youth in a facility with short-term stays, you know, of five, six, seven days as opposed to those uh, that are in longer term facilities. Um, what does the population look like that, that you're dealing with and how are you going to prioritize or define who, who gets uh, the most transition services or intensified transition services? Um, sometimes facilities uh, target all youth in sort of a tiered model and all youth get basic transition related services and then depending on need uh, that the provision of services increases uh, perhaps the, the closer the individual is to release or uh, the more intense their needs are um, if those are special education related or, or mental health related. Um, so defining the population and their needs. Uh, one of the other obstacles is, is terminology. We know that uh, we throw around a lot of jargon in corrections um, as well as in education and special education. 
one of the things that that I like to do when I bring communities and groups together is to create kind of a glossary of terms because many people from the education side don't necessarily speak corrections language. Uh, so it's important to come up with common terminology. Along with that is, is that definition of recidivism uh, that Peter mentioned. We need to, to come up with ways to measure transition outcomes beyond recidivism. But when we do use recidivism as a measure, we need to clearly define what that means. Does that mean uh, a parole revocation or does that mean a new charge? Um, also, uh, inadequate resources and supports are some of the other obstacles that we face. Um, we know that uh, transition isn't always funded as well as it could or should be. Um, sometimes it's a, a somewhat of an afterthought or transition planning begins in a, in a very rushed um, way uh, a month or so prior to a youth's release. Uh, so we need to find sustainable sources of um, funding and support for transition. Do you want to thank you, Peter? All right, um, we know there are many obstacles. Fiscal responsibility is another one of those. Who pays for what? Um, is it uh, the public school district that should provide a transition specialist to help youth uh, re-enroll in school once they're released? Or is it uh, the juvenile justice facility? And how is that person funded? Um, if it isn't a, a, a specific transition person? Um, or is it the job of the parole or, or the probation officer? Um, and where do those funds come from? Do those funds come from a community corrections budget or do they come from an education budget? Um, so fiscal responsibility, who's going to pay for what is, is frequently an obstacle. Um, decision making, we know that transition should happen as a team um, and that youth and that educator and that parole or probation officer, family service folks um, or other community corrections folks, service providers should be a part of that team. Um, and the decision making should be guided in the best interest of the student or the youth. Um, but we know that frequently Unfortunately, that's not the case. Sometimes it's it's dictated by uh, space, uh, who has a bed open where, or sometimes it's dictated by funding. Um, so decision making is a, is another obstacle. Uh, responsibilities and expectations. Um, who does what in this whole? transition process? When does my job end and someone else's begin? Is there a handoff uh, in terms of who's responsible for what and ensuring that uh, an individual makes that successful transition? And what are the expectations of these different individuals within the roles that they play? Um, I think it's important that, that their responsibilities and their expectations are included in their job descriptions so that uh, there's clarity about who does what. And although it should be a team effort, we don't want to duplicate uh, responsibilities or efforts. We want to streamline, but we also want to um, know who's doing what and have a responsible party. Um, I think one of the, the most challenging is this last one, agency and institutional culture. Um, we know that these are political entities and that changes in elected officials and administrators occur frequently. Um, but I think the more that the, more the culture of these institutions can change and, and the leadership can focus on transition and successful engagement post-release, uh, the, the easier it will be to accomplish those goals. 
Um, thank you, Heather. Um, let, let me just uh, add a point about responsibilities and expectations. Uh, you know, many agencies have MOUs or memorandum memoranda of understanding about those kinds of things. But but too often, at least in, in many of the ones that I've looked at, they're 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 worded fairly vaguely, and it's not explicit about who does what, particularly as part of the transition process. Usually it's an agreement to collaborate to do something, but it's usually fairly broadly written. And so some of the challenges and obstacles that Heather is referring to, I think could be addressed in part through, a, through an MOU as a vehicle for talking about those um, among the agencies and among the players. Um, let, let me turn now to uh, a brief discussion about remedies. And again, um, you know, it's always dangerous to suggest that you know how to how to solve or respond to the kinds of problems and the challenges associated with successfully returning children to the community following uh, a short or long-term stay in a, in a juvenile correctional facility. Um, as Heather mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the plans, if they're going to be successful, really need to be individualized. And, and I, can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, when Heather and I were planning this um, a couple of days ago, or I should say reviewing, reviewing it, um, one of the things that we talked a little bit about is how challenging it is for us as adults when we experience transitions and how um, usually our transitions, if we think about them, big transitions like births, deaths, weddings, divorces, new jobs, things like that, usually we get them sequentially. We don't get them all at the same time. Um, when they do all, when, they, when more than one occurs at the same time, we often experience a crisis and we need support of family and friends or sometimes professionals. But when we take kids out of a juvenile correctional facility and send them back to the community, everything in their life changes, where they sleep, where they eat, where they go to school, who they spend their time with. And so this notion of individualizing the plans for youth is really a way of saying the youth needs to be plugged into the process and the youth, the, the plans that we develop need to be individually tailored and the youth needs to be very involved in that process. Um, next point, um, this notion of uh, a systematic or a systemic uh, planning process. The meetings about transition need to be an ongoing part uh, of the organization within the facility. Uh, part of that process is figuring out what we know, again, looking at evaluation data perhaps, uh, what do we know about what happens to youth after they leave the facility? Um, where do we get that information from? Do, are we, do we just get it from the school? Are we just hearing from the probation officers? Do we get information from families uh, about the success uh, or the challenges faced by the youth who have left the facility? If, we're, uh, if youth are transitioning to treatment programs, are we getting information from those programs about how, how good the fit is between the youth and the program as we recently left our facility? Um, we need to have a a, a, a way of thinking about how to how to problem solve when transition doesn't go as expected and what kinds of additional information, what kind of alternative uh, strategies we're going to use to to address that. And, and then a third point here is is the idea that within schools, programs, agencies, there needs to be a go to person that we can reach relatively easily on the phone or through a, a text message or um, an email that will respond to our need for information about the transition process, uh, the, the need to establish a meeting, set up a meeting prior to that transition. Um, I, I can't emphasize how important that is. If we have a school district that serves 30 or 40,000 kids and has eight or 10 high schools and a few alternative programs, we need more than one person, more than one contact within that school district. We need points of contact within those alternative schools and within those high schools where many of the youth come from. Um, another point, another remedy or approach to addressing this, the, the challenge of transition is this notion of developing uh, among the players a shared ownership uh, a shared uh, responsibility for transition success, re-enrollment and engagement. And, and it follows that if we share ownership for transition success, 
when it doesn't go well, we need to own the fact that we have a, a collective responsibility to, to see what should have gone, uh, should have been handled differently, um, where, where, the, where the gaps are in terms of services and supports for youth. <clears throat> we also need to, to kind of, we need to emphasize the notion that we have a shared responsibility that the children that are incarcerated in our juvenile correctional facilities belong to communities. Um, we need to help communities understand, um, and, and many, many in the communities already do, but help them understand that it's good for the communities to, to uh, support these kids as they re-engage, whether that means you know, helping them find jobs, uh, placements in alternative sites, uh, volunteer opportunities, uh, linking them with mentors, um, but but the idea that these are all of our youth and uh, it's important that we share their their success. Um, identifying and supporting uh, uh, community partners and collaborative collaborators is is really a critical piece. I don't think as a, a facility as an agency head or as a superintendent of a, of a facility, a principal at a facility, I don't think we can say enough nice things about the people that support our youth. We need to acknowledge them um, through special activities. We need to acknowledge their support publicly because they're really key to making this um, successful. Uh, we, we can't, we can't um, underestimate the value that they play and the value that they contribute to this transition process. Another piece um, about remedies, some other things, and again, this gets back to this um, measuring outcomes and, and evaluation piece that we mentioned in the introduction. Um, the idea that we need to track services uh, that we want youth to receive. We need to look at uh, who was involved, who provided the support, um, if they were seen by specialized treatment providers, if they were um, in re-enrolled in an alternative school or a comprehensive high school. Um, what, was the, what was the time between the youth leaving the facility and their re-enrollment? Um, did we build into it a, a furlough day uh, or a, a visit to the facility prior to the release from uh, the, the, the program? Um, did we invite those folks from the program to visit the youth and make some connections before release? Um, those are all things that we can count and that we can, can that we can track if they're part of our transition plan. Um, uh, has the program been implemented? Has the transition process been implemented as we've designed it? Or are there aspects that we thought we could do but that are just impossible because of uh, fiscal restraints, because of um, uh, regulatory um, obstacles? Maybe those are things that need to be <laughs> But measuring the outcomes uh, enables us to understand what we need to address um, as we move forward. Um, and then finally, um, routine metrics, routine measures. So we can talk about, as, as Heather mentioned earlier, we can talk about credits earned, we can talk about re-enrollment, we can talk about length of time in program following release, we can talk about kids um, uh, attending uh, treatments or therapies, things like that. Oops, I'm I don't know if I've I got on the wrong slide here. There we go. Sorry, um, it was it was just on my computer. Um, so so ha having something that we can measure and then reflect upon and discuss as part of the process is is really essential. So now let me turn this. There we go. Let me turn this back over to Heather. Um. Our next, Our next section is to share with you some resources related to transition. There are many out there. There are many that, that speak to transition broadly um, from maybe a, a regular ed or a public ed uh, perspective. There are some that speak specifically to a special education perspective. And then there are those that speak to um, reentry, transition as reentry from correctional facilities. Uh, as you, I hope, are aware, NDTAC, or the National Technical Assistance Center for Neglected and Delinquent uh, Youth, they provide a number of resources specifically related to education and 
um, neglected and delinquent populations. And the one that's highlighted here is a, a transition toolkit. And there are just a couple things I want to mention about this resource. Um, one, the, the strategies within this toolkit are, um, are organized around different phases in transition. I mentioned that, that there are multiple transitions that youth go through. There are multiple transitions that, that facilities um, go through with these youth as well. So there are different things or different strategies that should take place when a youth enters a facility. Um, transition really needs to begin at day one or even before um, if facilities know that youth are coming to them from their local law enforcement or from detention, there are things that they can do prior even to the youth arriving at the facility. So strategies at entry or prior to entry, there are strategies for residency. Um, what are things that youth and staff can be working on to foster a successful transition, even while students are there. Things like, um, like transition curriculums, career and technical education courses, uh, those soft skill courses, fostering self-determination and problem solving and decision making. Uh, those are frequently the, the areas of greatest need for these youth. Um, they can earn certificates and earn credits um, but when they re-enroll or when they obtain employment, uh, it's frequently those social skills and inability to, to maybe temper their anger that get them in trouble uh, when they are released. So there are strategies for release as well, right, up, right before release and during release, and then strategies uh, during aftercare. So it's organized in in that way, these different phases of transition. Um, it's also organized by uh, the entity responsible. So as Peter and I have both mentioned, um, transition isn't just one person's job. There are responsibilities that the facility should undertake. There are responsibilities that the user, individual, him or herself should undertake. Um, there are things that parents and guardians uh, can do, as well as things that the community can do at each stage of transition. Um, the community should not just be involved at that release point, but should be involved early on. Uh, employers can come in and do presentations. Um, schools can uh, come in and talk about enrollment requirements um, or come in for special education meetings or IEP meetings. Um, so there are a number of things different individuals can do at each stage of transition. Uh, within this resource, there is also a self-study and planning tool that facilities can use or school districts can use um, because we know that transition is really individualized depending on the environment uh, within which it's it's happening. It's localized. Um, some JJ facilities uh, may be leading that transition process, and they're the ones that that do this, uh, utilize this planning tool and lead. Uh, whereas in in other jurisdictions, it may be the public school district that really is reaching into the facility to help facilitate transition. Um, so however individualized transition is in your location, this self-study tool can help you define priorities, assess what the needs are, what your strengths are, and really move forward uh, and create more successful transitions for youth. Okay, full, full disclosure, um, Heather had a handle in uh, developing that transition guide. Um, um, a major handle, and, and it was published by Simone's um, shop, uh, NDTAC. Um, but it's really, it's an excellent toolkit. Um, lots of very useful information. Um, I wanted to mention 
um, a few other uh, resources. Um, the second, so the first one listed there, the transition toolkit Heather just mentioned um, or discussed in some detail. The second one, you got this, Educational Pathways, is a document that was published um, in 2016 by the uh, U.S. Department of Education. Um, it's really, um, it's in part, it's directed to youth, but it's very useful for adults to think about how to talk to youth about the transition pro uh, process. Um, the, the document contains checklists, um, it contains um, a number of steps. Uh, it discusses options. Um, it helps youth understand um, the big picture about kind of engaging and becoming an adult member of a community. Um, and it gives them things to think about with regard to education, employment, living, a whole host of things. It's, it's really a great, a great resource. The third one listed here is a guidance package um, about correctional education issued by the Department of Ed and the Department of Justice jointly in 2014. Um, it's, uh, it's broad in that it talks about the idea that incarcerated youth don't surrender any of their basic rights to quality educational services and supports around special education, um, around career and technical education, um, the, the idea that the, it's, in, it's essential that their transition from facilities back to the community um, is adequately supported by the agencies, um, both on the inside of the fence as well as uh, in the community. Um, so it's a really, it's a nice overview and there's a number of resources that are referenced in that particular uh, document. It's also, um, if, you, if one as, assesses um, transition services in, in, in his or her community and decides that there's some things that aren't there, it provides a really nice set of um, citations to why it's required to do the kinds of things we're talking about and that that's embedded in uh, federal law, embedded in, in, in a number of other um, regulations. Um, the last uh, resource listed on this page positive outcomes, strategies for assessing the progress of youth involved in the justice system, which was just published in February uh, by the John Jay um, College in New York City. Jeff Butts and his colleagues put this together. Um, it's a really nice way of thinking about uh, positive youth development and uh, measuring um, youth successful engagement, both inside correctional facilities as well as uh, in the community, it's a, it's a, it's it's broader than transition, but it really it it meshes very well with some of the things we're talking about today, with identifying um, the important steps and the important processes uh, associated with youth um, kind of emerging from this, for many of them, troubled adolescence and becoming um, kind of responsive uh, young citizens, which is of course what we want them to all become. So let's uh, talk about strategies here. Uh, Heather, do you want to start this off? Sure. Um, as Peter and I have both mentioned, um, you really need to begin with the end in mind. Uh, we're reaching all the way back to the Stephen Covey, uh, who I think was the first to, to quote that. Um, but transition begins day one and even before that. Um, there are many proactive strategies that facilities Facility. and those involved in the transition process can employ to help make those transitions smoother, beginning even before kids come to the facility. So I think starting early, talking to kids about it early, one of the strategies that we employ here is we do a transition based interview with all of our youth within the first three weeks or so that they're at the facility and it really focuses on what they want to do post release and identifying some of their own barriers and then creating goals and uh, objectives for overcoming those barriers 
and we use that document to um, fuel the reentry plan um, or the transition plan, whatever it may be called in, in your area. I think that it's important that those plans be aligned as closely as possible to um, frequently we we have a duplication of efforts we have many different transition plans and I think if we start early and utilize the information that's been given to us um, by public schools or by detention facilities to build that reentry or transition plan and those goals and objectives are aligned with IEPs, if that student is a student with a disability, or with a continuous case plan or a reentry plan, um, the better off we are because all of the concerned and caring adults uh, are on the same page, and the better off the youth is because we're all working towards the same outcome. So uh, the, the second point there, providing support services that are essential to help some youth to succeed um, is just a reminder that um, you know one size doesn't fit all. Some youth have intense mental health needs, um, and in fact, as as fewer youth are being incarcerated, uh, detained, or committed, um, many in many jurisdictions, the, the youth that uh, remain um, in the system in, in secure settings are kids with more intense needs. So it's it's essential that we connect with those providers in the community, um, not just educators, but also mental health professionals, um, folks working for um, social service agencies to ensure that we have everything in place to support that transition to ensure that youth are, success, are, are successful. Um, um, our third point about ensuring interagency collaboration and communication, uh, another thing that, that we've learned here is that this is an ongoing process. Players are always changing in the transition game. There are new service providers involved. There are new employees within those agencies. There are new secure care facility staff. So that awareness that needs to take place in terms of what facilities offer, what types of programs they have, what the needs of the youth are, what service providers in the community offer, what types of services are available. It is an ongoing, constant process of awareness and collaboration. Um, and what we found is, is that community providers are willing to, to be engaged. They just need to be invited to the table. Uh, employers are interested in these youth and, and want to give them a chance and they too need to be invited to the table. They're much more comfortable when, when they have, can put a name with a face or they have a contact person. Um, if we're helping facilitate a transition back to the community or, or into a job, if they have someone that they can communicate with on a regular basis, um, they're much more willing to do that and uh, to go the extra mile in, in helping these youth succeed. Um, yeah, absolutely, Tether. And, and, and one way to, to, to start that process and to expand that partnership beyond what's traditionally a, a lot of faith-based organizations who are, are, are very willing and interested in connecting with kids is to invite some of those partners um, you know, from from uh, the local chamber of commerce, uh, businesses, others um, inside the fence to showcase some of the work that the youth are doing, to um, to to observe a uh, a sporting event, give them a chance to see what these kids are like, have them meet the student council if you have a student council in your facility, so that they develop this sense that yeah, these kids are from our community, and and I'm going to figure out what I can do to support them. As, uh, as, as young citizens. And then it's easier to get them at the table to talk about um, internships, to talk about job placements, things like that, once they've kind of engaged with the program and the facility. Uh, our next strategy talks about um, giving youth a voice. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that 
if the youth is not involved in his or her transition plan, uh, then obviously he or she is less bought into that plan. They're less committed to it. And chances are we'll be less successful. Um, I've sat around uh, release boards where um, the youth has voiced his opinion about going to a specific placement and, you know, has said, if I, if I go there, I will run. And unfortunately, sometimes we feel like our hands are tied and, and we can't honor that youth voice when we don't listen to what they know about themselves. Um, and the chances are that if we don't, uh, their, their transition is going to be less successful. Um, there are youth that, that know themselves well. There are others that, um, you know, need a little help in the, that self-actualization part. But um, sometimes they are very strong-willed as well, uh, as I'm sure you know. And so if they make up their mind that, you know, this isn't going to work for them, this placement or this setting or uh, this release, um, you know, they can self-sabotage quite easily. Um, so I think that giving youth a voice, um, helps them own their own transition and it is theirs after all. And some, you know, maybe uh, in a place to do that more, uh, and have more maturity and, uh, around that than others. Um, but if we feel that, you know, it's only adults, the adults voice that we need to listen to or. And we all believe we're well intentioned. Um, I think that, I think that uh, we're missing the mark if we don't allow the youth's voice to be heard as well. Um, so the final point here in terms of strategies, and then I, I know that we want to get to some some questions um, from the uh, participants in the webinar. Um, uh, the, the last point developing within agency and cross agency leadership, I mean, that's really key. Um, you have to have folks um, that are willing to kind of push the envelope to ensure that um, our, our lofty rhetoric about the, the outcomes that we want for these kids and the support that we're gonna surprise, uh, provide, that it's, that it's um, kind of connected with reality. And we have to have folks that can be fearless sometimes in the face of um, challenges saying, hey, it's impossible to do that. Um, uh, you know, that that can't work here. You don't understand the system. Um, I, I think I think developing leadership um, is 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 no easy task. Um, I think having uh, mentors for younger staff um, is is important. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of, uh, of staff development that involves um, having leaders within agencies visit other jurisdictions, uh, maybe across state or maybe in, a, in an adjacent state or in another part of the country, they really look at how another agency handles something that we find particularly challenging, like transition in, in our agency. Um, but I, I, I don't think we can um, emphasize enough how important this whole issue of leadership is. Um, you know, it starts at the, it starts at the and, and and it filters down and everyone at the table, uh, everyone down to the classroom, down to the uh, to, to the living unit, has to have this notion that what we do is is part of transition. Is we prepare kids to become successful in the community, and we all need to, to to speak a common language and share a set of values about how important that is. And and that starts with leadership, I believe, at the top of the agency, but also at the supervisory level within agencies. So I think that's. I think that's about all uh, Heather and I had to discuss. And, and of course, what we want transition to be is something more than this cartoon suggests, you know, be good, right? And so that's not a transition plan. Okay, thank you, Peter and Heather. This is uh, Simone Gosselin from uh, MDTAC. Uh, thanks a lot for the, the information you shared with us. We can tell both of you uh, have, have done a considerable amount of work uh, across the country, not only in research and evaluation of what works, but also the practical piece of working with uh, detention centers as well as secure care settings. So one, one of the questions we have, uh, a 
addresses uh, thought uh, 14 or 15 that you just um, identified when you talked about some strategies. And uh, the person says, you know, provide the, what you suggested, I should say, on this slide is uh, that you suggested that uh, juvenile justice facilities, juvenile justice personnel, probation should provide support services that are essential to help uh, youth succeed. What, what are some of the typical supports and services that you've seen in your work that have been implemented uh, that have been you know, pretty successful for those outcomes as far as the juvenile justice facility is concerned, juvenile justice personnel, it could be the court, and or probation? All right, Heather, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Sure, I can start. Um, I think one of the, the things that we've seen as essential is to have a transition point person. There needs to be someone um, that outside providers and school districts and employers can direct questions and to. There needs to be one person that facilitates, helps that youth facilitate his or her transition. So whether that be a transition specialist or if it is the job of the parole or probation officer, they need to have the resources and time, mainly time, available to do that. Um, what we found is it works best when it is a transition person um, and not a, a parole or probation officer. Um, it's important to have that one key person. I think uh, it's also important, as, as Peter and I have both mentioned, that the culture of the agency and the leadership of the agency embraces transition and prioritizes it. Um, it's, it's easy to find other priorities or have other priorities imposed upon you, but I think the more that we keep transition at the forefront, because that really is the goal. We don't want these kids back. We want to educate uh, and remediate and, and rehabilitate so that they can function productively um, outside of the fence. So I think the culture, the leadership, um, everything needs everything. to focus on transition and support that. Um, I think there needs to be a transition-based curriculum that's infused uh, into the education programming for youth, whether that be um, in the actual school or whether that be on the unit. Um, I think there are uh, transition-related lessons that need to happen, and those can be tied to education and should be tied to education, um, but they include those soft skills and those social skills like decision making and self determination um, that we don't always function or don't always uh, focus on uh, because we're trying to remediate credits, we're trying to um, get kids back on track academically, uh, but those soft skills are equally as important. So those three things are the ones that come to mind first. Yeah, those are those are great points, um, Heather. Um, a couple of things that I might add to it, and and one is, and this is thinking about uh, in the community, a school level point person. Um, there, there's a, a program developed um, a number of years ago called Check and Connect. And I know some juvenile justice agencies, some schools have used it. And it's a, it's a point of contact within the school that a youth returning to the school um, has as, a, as, as kind of a source of support. It's someone who helps them get their schedule together, that checks in on them maybe uh, once or twice a day. Um, it's, it's, it's their contact in the school, someone who's kind of looking out for them. Um, uh, another another uh, important piece and another source of support are mentors. And again, this can be something from the community like big brothers, big sisters, someone who is available in the non-school hours, who can connect with the youth and help that youth get engaged um, 
in, in some after school tutoring, some athletic activities, some fun cultural activities, but it's it's part of that part of that mix, I think, that can provide supports um, to individual youth. Um, uh, and then and then one other piece, uh, this notion of intensive probation services. Some kids need more than your typical, you know, given their history and given their needs, um, need more than a traditional probation um, kind of offering. And and again, that's highly dependent on a jurisdiction and the resources and how they decide which kids need more intensive services. But I think that's that certainly should be part of the conversation. Well, thank you, Peter and Heather, for giving, uh, giving the participants you know, some real specific examples of that as far as strategies. And I will just mention, based on what both of you said around a transition coordinator, one person who has that responsibility of continuing that youngster's engagement uh, upon, upon release uh, is on IndyTAC's website, there's a transition coordinator's job description and also a program description of the educational advocacy program that's utilized in Washington State. So, if, you know, you think that might be something that would be very helpful to your system. Uh, if you go to uh, IndyTech's website, you can locate a job description and a program description for uh, su such a, an individual in an effort. There's one, uh, one other question, uh, just a couple of others, but let me try and get into this one. Engaging youth uh, in their education in short-term detention settings is a pretty difficult task. Um, any Quick suggestions on how to engage youth who are in a short-term sort of setting uh, and then, you know, trying to keep them engaged to move into their school, uh, community schools when they are uh, released, which could be five days later, eight days later, that sort of thing. Uh, sure, if I can, if I can jump in here. Um, I, I think that um, in, in short-term facilities, the, the, the first thing the kids should hit is, is a welcome center that basically says, we're gonna try to get you, uh, we're gonna try to figure out what the situation is with regard to credits and your transcripts. And in that welcome center, there's an intake classroom and the primary focus is numeracy, literacy, and current events. And, and the kids are get become engaged through things like CNN Student News, through some problem solving activities and some topical things um, in, um, in, in, in reading or language arts, as well as in numeracy. And, and then even in, in a short-term facility for, for kids who aren't gonna be there very long, you can do some problem-based learning activities that uh, ensure a high degree of success. Because these are kids, many of these kids have been out of school a long period of time. And even if they're just there for four or five days or a week or two, you want them mm -hmm. accomplishing something and starting to think of themselves as, as, as possible uh, material that, that someone that can be successful in school. Um, and again, these kids are, many of them are kids who've been out of school a long period of time and have not been terribly successful at school. Right, I would just add to, to what Peter said by um, mentioning that many of the successful education programs I see in short-term detention facilities have a very strong partnership with their local school district or districts. Um, and I know that that's not easy to do in larger jurisdictions where there may be multiple school districts, um, but the more you can focus on data sharing and those memorandums of understanding and um, Lessons, lessons can be shared back and forth between detention and public schools. Um, I think the better off for continuity of services for those youth. However, I realize that those, those relationships take time to build and that it's not always possible. And so uh, I think that some of the best strategies for short-term facilities focus around really um, discovery and fact-finding for the youth and um, in terms of gathering all relevant information uh, to pass on to the next placement or, or school site where that individual is going to be transitioning to. Well, well Heather Grilla clark and Peter Leone, uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining our webinar today uh, and, and uh, sharing such a great amount of information 
the resources for today's um, webinar that Heather and Heather are identified for you there on the screen. And I'm going to turn things over to uh, Peter Forbes, who has just one last minute, uh, uh, one last minute comment to provide to everybody. So thank you, thank you, Simone and uh, Peter and Heather. That was excellent. I made a half dozen notes of things that I'm going to be following up on. So I hope the audience found that as as helpful and relevant as I did. Uh, we do have a call in July, and um, we have Kim Godfrey from Performance Based Standards and Nina Solomon from uh, CSG, Council of State Government, and Nina and, and um, Kim are going to continue this discussion about reentry. We're going to do two sessions on uh, reentry and reengagement strategies because we feel it's so important. So thank you very much for hanging in there on the call. I hope you found it helpful, and I hope you have the opportunity to join us in July. Thank you so much. Thank you. And don't forget the survey. <laughs> Take care.